Uh, we have an incredibly, uh, uh, incredible panel here to address this. Many of them are working uh, in the Southwest. Um, we've got Linda Childers, who's uh, CEO of the Daniels Fund in uh, Denver, which is based in Denver and is working in Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and New Mexico. You know, I had the good fortune to know Bill Daniels. He was one of the pioneers of the cable TV industry. Um, he was a guy who had um, a heart that was just amazing, and his number one concern was helping young people succeed and find a job in the economy. That's what it was all about. When he passed away, he left his fortune to create the Daniels Fund. Uh, if he was still alive today, uh, he would be our keynote speaker um, at this conference. He really believed in, in these issues. Then we have Alvin Warren, who's the program office, officer for the Kellogg Foundation in New Mexico. Kellogg has been working in New Mexico for 70 years, going all the way back to 1945. He's going to be able to share some very valuable lessons. He was also, for three years, uh, the Secretary of State for Native Americans in New Mexico. Um, and that certainly relates to our uh, Native American team here today. Uh, then we have Lorenzo Esters, uh, who recently joined um, USA Funds. Uh, USA Funds has a national focus on trying to address the 40-50 problem that I talked about earlier. 40% of our people who enter college don't complete, and 50% who do end up unemployed or underemployed. They're trying to attack that problem. Then we have Paul Markham from the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the largest philanthropy in the, in the U.S. focused on, on uh, these issues. Uh, he's going to be talking about the work they're doing and how that's evolved. And finally, from the business perspective, we have Jack Grayson. He's CEO of a group called APQC. They started out focusing on the need to improve productivity and quality. They're now turning their attention to the need for systemic education reform. He has over 400 major corporate partners, companies like IBM and Exxon. And moderating the panel is one of the most distinguished citizens in, in the state of Arizona, Carolyn Warner. You know, uh, if you don't know Carolyn, she's a real legend. Uh, she was the superintendent of schools here for 12 years. She did not give up on education when she left that job. She's been active in education reform ever since then. Let me also tell you that her grandson uh, served as um, Speaker of the House in the Florida legislature. How many other people in America can make a statement like that? Uh, so you can stop listening to Dr. Oz and listen to Carolyn Warner in terms of the uh, secrets of vitality um, going on for a long time. And I'll turn it over to uh, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a most energizing two days. Do you agree with that? I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you the thoughts, the wisdom, the brain power of some of the most important people in the United States because of their experience, because of their commitment, because of their belief system in the work ethic, yes, but also their belief in the worth ethic. And I think uh, early on that uh, Selena mentioned those two words in the same sentence, work and worth. And once we have come to the conclusion that one equates with the other, then we will have solved economic development and economic success for all of America. And that will then be the introduction to the challenge that we have given our panel this morning. If these two days have reminded us of nothing else, it has raised our awareness of the immensity of the challenge, earlier described as turning an aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean. It takes a long time, and it has to be very steadily done, and it is going to take a great deal of ocean in which to make the turn. We, however, here in the Southwest, have an opportunity to collaborate, to cooperate, to share ideas, to understand the transportability of all of the things that we do in individual states and begin to put them together and build a fabric of success for economic development and workforce training for our young people and the opportunity for education and economic success for all of our children. That's our legacy. Someone said a long time ago that the greatest use of life is to spend it 
on something that will outlast it. That's what this is all about. And that's why this first conference of the Global Pathways Institute, not even quite yet one year old, is perhaps the most momentous thing that has happened amongst these states of the Southwest. And so, before I go any further, I want to begin with our panel. We have such a distinguished group. Linda Childers uh, is, in my view, a brilliant woman. And she would probably argue that she's just one of many, but what she does is save lives, save lives, and create opportunities that otherwise would be denied. And so may I ask uh, if you don't mind to describe even more than Bill did what the Daniels Fund does and what you anticipate it doing as years go by. Linda. Yeah, it will be. Hello, hello, there we go. Well, it is my pleasure to share a little bit with, uh, with all of you about the Daniels Fund and the great work that we're privileged to do. Uh, the states that, uh, that Bill mentioned were Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, and Utah, and each of those states had a very special personal meaning to Bill Daniels, who is the founder and the, the gentleman that funded our foundation. 70% of the work we do is in grants to nonprofits, and rel relevant to the conversations that we're having, we fund in youth development, early childhood, K-12, ethics, uh, financial literacy, a number of things that have been discussed here. And we have some tremendous partnerships in New Mexico, Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado doing great work in these areas. The thing that I think is probably most relevant to what you're talking about here, though, is our scholarship program. And that's 30% of the foundation's distribution. And the scholarship program, we're looking for kids, and Bill, Bill Daniels could not have been any more specific about what he wanted done with his dough. And the scholarship program, he said, find me kids with character, leadership, and promise that they will go out and change the world and be active, engaged citizens. Very quantifiable things to look at when you're selecting kids for a scholarship. 100% uh, of our kids are economic need-based. So we have, we're, we're dealing with the exact students that this whole conference has been trying to work with. And, and we've had some tremendous success. We've had over 3,000 scholars in the program in our 15 years. But as we look back at about 2009, when the whole world seemed upside down and crazy, our kids were having just a terrible time finding finding work. And at that point, we sat down and said, the big guy, that's what we call Bill Daniels, the big guy would not be real happy with this. Because for Bill, the degree was important. But what was more important was meaningful work at the end of the day. The degree was the so that they can move into the, the meaningful work. So as we sat back and looked at that, we said, what can we be doing that we're not? So first of all, a huge percentage of our kids, close to 80%, are first-generation college students, and you know what that means. So we have staff that support them. We have staff on the ground in the universities where we have a lot of kids. We make a grant to those universities to pay special attention and make sure that they're, that they're in, uh, on track and working with it. Second thing we said is we're serious about a four-year graduation rate with 1,000 kids in college if we're not in a four-year graduation rate, then we're, it's lost opportunity for other kids. So someone said earlier today, the focus early on and even starting into elementary school, we're looking for the young people who are motivated and who have a vision about what they want to do. We all know they're going to change it, but at least they have a focus and they've got a goal and they're starting to think that way. So we built a program that we call the Grad Plan, where we ask them to identify that, that target uh, degree program and the sequence of courses they're going to need to have to take to be on track for that four-year graduation. When they fall off track, we know about it much sooner than we do at the end of that four years. And that's, that's when we say we're happy to keep you on the list, but we're going to stop the funding until you earn your way back in. Then we also said, 
are we hearing what we want to hear in terms of employers wanting to hire these kids? So like many of you have talked about at this conference, Scott Southworth, who is here with me, uh, we met with employers all over the four states and we said, what are you seeing? What are you finding? What do you wish you were finding? And it was exactly the script you would expect over and over and over again. And as we looked at those things, we said that is exactly what Bill Daniels was about as well. So we have developed some supplemental materials to help polish them, if you will, to be what the employers are looking for. They're like mini TED Talks. We have 32 of them. It's not there for the scholars if they want them to watch, uh, if they want to watch them. It's required. We make sure they're on track, and each year that they're there. Scott and I had dinner last night with a number of scholars that are, are, are down here in, in either a, uh, AU or ASU, and they're saying, well, I learned a lot. I make my friends watch them with me, and you know, I, I get a lot out of it. There's one that is just before you go for an interview. Here are some of the things that you think about. The next thing we did was go back to those same employers, and by the way, we asked the CEOs of these companies to help us select the scholars. So they're impressed with the kids from the very beginning, and they're very in touch with what we're trying to get done. We said, will you help us with internships? Will you help us with employment? And we shared with them what we're doing to give these kids the work ethic edge that everyone said was missing. And it's worked tremendously. We have a number of partner companies that uh, Tell us they'll go straight here, straight to us for the jobs that they need rather than even looking for them elsewhere because they like the fact that the kids were character leadership and all those things from the very selection. So that's kind of our approach to, uh, to scholarships. The question we get a lot is how's the four-year graduation going? And keeping in mind we're dealing with the low-income group, uh, our graduation rates for four, year are, four years are approaching 75%. If we carry it on to the six years, noticing that we are stopping the funding, we're closer to 85%. We're pretty proud of that. We know Bill would not be. Bill would want 100%. So that's what we're, that's what we're working toward. But that, in a nutshell, I think is, is what we're doing. So. Is this, there we are, thank you. Um, the essential employability skills. That's what you're talking about, is it not? That you have developed, and that is a requirement for each of your, each of your scholarship winners. Uh, let me ask you this. From the work that you have done with Daniels, uh, what have you learned about achieving systemic impact? long-term impact, what is the one takeaway that you've learned from observing all of your students who've benefited by Daniels? Well, I think the systemic impact in, in our world is one individual at a time. Um, a lot of you are here talking about states, talking about regions, talking about school districts, and we applaud you for that. That's hard, 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 hard work. Our goal is one individual at a time, Hopefully they move into influential positions and they help turn things around. But I think for a foundation to, to say we're trying to make a major change in that area, it'd be more individual at a time. And I think we feel pretty good about the change that those made. On the grant side of the house, however, we are looking at some systemic change in the K-12 area, for instance, and, and in the youth development area. And in, those are much harder to manage. Area, what are the changes that you're looking at now? Um, our founder really liked uh, market choice, really liked um, innovation, really liked a different approach. So we've funded a large number of charter schools. And of course, not all charters are successful either. But if you look at the charters compared to some of the, the districts where the kids might have otherwise been, we're feeling pretty good about the charter school performance. Some exciting things happening in New Mexico with early college high school and Mission Graduate, which is a community collaborative to, to really work on all aspects of a challenging environment for kids. In Utah, we're working on some collective impact models in that area as well, where all the people that touch these, these kids throughout are coming together to work together. So we're, we're feeling good about those. Our, our friends in Wyoming, uh, the one university in Wyoming, they're, they're talking about a revamp of their school of education which is pretty exciting on how to, how to think about it in a different way. So those would all be in the systemic category for sure. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much. Our next uh, presenter today is uh, Alvin Warren, the Kellogg Foundation. Alvin, the Kellogg Foundation has been working in New Mexico for 70 years. So why has Kellogg chosen to focus on New Mexico? I want us, you to answer that for us and to tell us a bit about the work that has been done and what you have achieved over the years. And, and finally, I'd like you to speak, if you will, about your uh, work with the numerous tribes in New Mexico. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Alvin Warren. I come from a small tribal community in northern New Mexico called Santa Clara Pueblo or Capo de Owinge. Um, and I'm privileged to work for the Kellogg Foundation as um, one of the three program officers that are focused in New Mexico, and I'm actually based in New Mexico. So before I get to those questions, I have to say there's kind of an impossibly high uh, expectation that's been set. Um, first, we were introduced as some of the most important people in the United States. I, maybe the remainder of my panelists live up to that. I probably wouldn't put myself in that category. And then, and then Linda actually turned to me and said, have you personally been funding in New Mexico for the last 75 years? <laughs> can't, show, I can't say that your, I've been doing that either. So, so uh, You show your age quite well, actually. I know. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please reduce your expectations. You will not be disappointed. Um, I am here to share my perspective as, as a native and, in fact, as an indigenous New Mexican um, and also as a program officer for the Kellogg Foundation. And uh, I know these issues are personal for all of us, right? We wouldn't be in this room if they weren't. Um, they're personal for me because I've witnessed firsthand in my tribal community, um, in communities around me in northern New Mexico, predominantly Hispanic communities, in many of the communities we worked with. And I was, I was part of um, uh, a gubernatorial administration, was a member of the cabinet, traveled throughout the state. And, and I've seen firsthand how the lack of educational and economic opportunities can lead to a lifetime of struggle for our, our young people um, throughout our state. Um, as funders, as Linda mentioned, we, we share this bigger common vision, right, of trying to improve the lives of people across our state and the, the geographies where we work. We try to invest in programs and, and initiatives and policies that are innovative, that are impactful. Um, what's most difficult for us, what drives us, part of the reason why the Kellogg Foundation has chosen New Mexico to be one of our four priority places in the United States, is uh, this time of year is always a difficult time particularly for me, lots of people from New Mexico, because the kids count report's gonna be coming out again. And every time that report comes out, New Mexico and Mississippi are vying for the bottom of the list. And it isn't just statistics to any of us, right? We know that every single one of those numbers represents a life. And, and as the previous panel talked about, the potential in every single human being and that potential not being fully reached. And it is extremely personal to me because my wife and I both come from tribal communities. We both are fortunate to have college educations. Um, we chose to raise our three kids, not just in New Mexico, but in our tribal community. And when the slide went up yesterday uh, showing the Opportunity Index map, and I saw New Mexico with the most light colors of all the states in the region. You remember that saturation map that was shown yesterday that, that depicts the, the on one hand, I guess, the, the, the amount of opportunities, uh, but on the other hand, really the challenges, right, of, of young people in particular. Well, I chose to re raise my children in this state of New Mexico, and I know for a fact that that map doesn't represent all the potential and all the opportunity in my home state. But there's data that hasn't caught up with what we're, what, what, what we're capable of. So um, my children deserve better, all of our children deserve better, as, as Robert Putnam has said. So that's, that's part of why the Kellogg Foundation has been in New Mexico um, for the last, since the 1940s. Our focus is on health, on education, and on economic security for our state's most vulnerable children. Um, we have a particular focus on racial equity, which I'm very proud of. It's part of the reason I came to work for the foundation. So the majority of our work is focused on Hispanics and on Native Americans. Um, um, in particular geographies. You know, we've invested in things like Enlace that you might have heard of, Native American Higher Education Initiative, both of which were, were um, initiatives to ac help actually create 
stronger pathways for students to transition successfully from high school into college. Um, and now, because of the board's commitment, our board's commitment in 2008, to have New Mexico as a priority place, that we're gonna be there for a generation, at least a generation more, um, is it really gives us an opportunity to invest in deeper partnerships, deeper relationships. Um, I'm proud to tell you that since 2008, we've invested more than $100 million in the state. But I think equally important is the time that we've invested in building relationships, in building capacity, um, in, in testing some innovations. Um, but really what we've learned is, is, I think, hopefully, how to better partner. And, and you know, I look at this panel, I look at folks around the room, some of whom I'll name, you know, like, uh, like Linda, like Vicki Mora, uh, Jamee Bilvin, who we've, we've heard a lot about, Samantha Smith, many others who, who are not just our partners, but, but they've, they've guided us. They've helped us to understand where we can make the most difference. Um, and I know we might talk about how to bring efforts to scale later on in this discussion, but to me, that's one of the key pieces about systems change is, is forming strong, cooperative leadership where we're willing to collaborate with each other and, and share, share the load, share our insights, share our experiences, share our failures, right? Um, as a foundation, part of what we always tell our grantees is we, we aren't just here because we want to see your successes. We also want to know where things have not gone well because that's the only way we're all going to learn how to better address the challenges that we face. So um, a couple things that I want to mention, and, and what I love about this is, is you know, I, Linda and I could have shared our presentation because the innovations she talked about, um, we are also supporting. Uh, you know, the early college high schools work, we, we were maybe a little bit further ahead in that, but Daniel's Fund came in and saw the innovation and picked it up. And, and also, the state of New Mexico, the Secretary of Education, saw what was, what was possible with that and has helped to scale it up rapidly. That's an ideal situation for us. Um, in other cases, we followed, right? The ACE Leadership High School that, that Vicki helped to, to create in Albuquerque that's now turned into four um, industry-focused high schools. It was mentioned earlier where you have business involved in creating curriculum, you're gonna be more successful. There are four high schools, three already in existence, a fourth on the way that actually are already delivering this, this model for youth who, who either had already dropped out or were in danger of dropping out, who now are creating pathways, not just to graduation, but right into, into meaningful jobs. So those are some of the, the work that we've been proud to be part of, the, the Native American Community Academy, which is an amazing model um, in Albuquerque that's now branching out to create four other charter schools in New Mexico. The Bridge of Southern New Mexico, which we already talked about with the early college high schools. And I'm happy to talk more about these later on in, in, if folks have questions. Right now, moving forward, the things that I'd like to just highlight is we have three core strategies around family economic security in, in New Mexico and also nationally. First is the work that we're here to talk about, is how do we support, su support employment pathways and partnerships that lead to higher quality jobs? Um, innovate and educate. Jamay's work is, is a perfect example of that. Um, I was really happy to hear in the previous panel a, a strong mention of entrepreneurship. And we are equally invested in this as, as a funding strategy. And also at the same time, I would say asking questions because ultimately our, our goal with our family economic security work is to work in partnership with families so that they can lift themselves out of poverty. And so not only are we investing in entrepreneurship as one of those strategies, but we're also actually gonna test that um, with some work with national partners to actually look client by client, loan recipient, entrepreneur by entrepreneur to see if that actually proves out. Do we actually see that entrepreneurship leads to higher household income, improvement in, in the financial condition of families and in particularly of children? Um, you know, one of the things I'm excited about, Samantha is around here someplace, there you are. Um, we just recently approved a grant with the CNM Stimulus Center which is a, a, an amazing um, component of, of Central New Mexico Community College. Um, in particular, we're supporting um, a cohort or a portion of the folks that will go into their Ignite Community Accelerator. So pathways into business for uh, low-income entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs of color. And what we're hoping to do, this is in, in discussion now, is to pair that then with a, a PRI, the first uh, program-related investment that we will hopefully make in New Mexico that would actually then be able to provide capital to those entrepreneurs who would have difficulty or it would be impossible for them to access capital otherwise. Um, and finally, we know that we have to help parents to build assets. And 
The, th the thing that I want to lift up this is actually the work of my, my colleague, Paula Sam, and some of you may know Paula. Um, but bundled services is an approach that's been successful across the country. CNM also has become a national leader in this model. It's, it's uh, working with uh, the Working Family Success Network model, and it, it provides a range of supports that not only lead to better educational outcomes, but, are, but better overall outcomes for students. And now we've taken the work at CNM, and it now is in four other community and tribal colleges in New Mexico. So um, that's what I wanted to share just in, in terms of an introduction to the Kellogg Foundation, the work that we do. But I will answer the question about tribes very Please. quickly, which is um, yesterday, and I really got to credit Jacob with doing a great job in his remarks. Um, but here's what I noticed. I, I've served as a tribal leader in New Mexico on and off for the last 25 years. Um, Yes, I have gray hair. If the camera zooms in, you'll see I actually do have gray hair. Um, and I served three years as the Cabinet Secretary of Indian Affairs for the state. And I think one of the number one barriers that prevents more effective collaboration between states, counties, cities, and tribes is that in most conversations, tribal representatives have to begin with the 101 lesson. And so Jacob has incredible insights but had to spend a good portion of his comments yesterday just laying the background, right? Some of you may have been familiar with that background, which is great, but a good number of us are not. And frankly, there are not really mechanisms for us to become better aware of what the modern lived reality is for tribes and for Native Americans. We have to do something about that. Because we can't, when I worked, can, went to work for state government, my counterparts in the cabinet didn't have time for that one-on-one. They needed to know Here's an individual who needs my support. How best do I work respectfully, collaboratively with tribal governments, combining our systems, recognizing the jurisdictional distinctions? But we need to serve that individual. Because once that individual crosses into, into the state boundary or goes back into the reservation, there ultimately it's the same person that we all have to be serving. So the few suggestions I would give, and I'm happy to give more details later, New Mexico has a State Tribal Collaboration Act, which requires an amount of education to state employees about how to work effectively with tribes. Um, it is, we were the third state to have some sort of legislation like this. I think this is legislation that frankly should exist in all states that really cements a partnership relationship between tribal governments and states. Montana has something called the Indian Education Act for All. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, it actually isn't about education for Native Americans. It's about educating everybody in the state about tribes based on a curriculum that tribes develop themselves. That removes the need for that 101 because every single student going to school in a Montana public school knows about tribes. They understand tribal sovereignty. They know about tribal governments because that's a requirement of their state constitution and their state law. I think a lot of us could learn from that. Um, we can work with tri tribes as partners. So states, um, there are actually impressive lessons to be learned. I got an email from, from Jacob, uh, a woman who I think is in the room here, Lana Chanda, who is the, the Workforce Development Director for Gila River Indian Community. Impressive, impressive work that they're doing that maybe some of you know and maybe many of you do not know. So uh, creating those opportunities to actually learn from tribes what's working in tribal communities because in, it, the truth is Native Americans live, the majority of Native Americans live off the reservation. So those lessons I think have to be shared. So I think that far exceeds my introductory remark time Fortunately, I'm at the very end of the table, so I can just sip water while everybody else gets their comments. But thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Well, we are so grateful to you for, Alvin, for not only what you're doing, what you have done, but also for what you will do. And I am very grateful to you for recognizing what an outstanding citizen Jacob Moore is, because we in Arizona are very proud of Jacob, who served on the State Board of Education. Oh, yes. Indeed. And I am delighted that he is the compadre of yours um, and that uh, he has helped us with 101. We thank you very much. Now, our next presenter is Paul Markham. Paul is with the Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation, as all of you know, is the largest foundation working in both the secondary and post-secondary levels to improve student success uh, and to provide, hopefully, for economic security for all of our students. So, Paul, tell us briefly about how the foundation is working to address some of the hurdles that students have to actually being successful 
that uh, we've discussed at this conference and that you and Gates have had so much experience with that you can enlighten us. Please. Thank you. Thank you. So I have only two slides. And as I'm bringing it up, just a, uh, just a quick word of thanks. This is one of the most well done gatherings that I've ever seen, honestly, because so much of the work is where the rubber meets the road. And I, I, have a, I do a lot of these talks on uh, Gates' strategy, but I'm just going to follow the lead of the panel because uh, with a word about your personal background, and uh, that's just so important. I'm a fifth-generation dairy, Kentucky, rural Kentucky dairy farmer is where I came from. So I, uh, all I knew growing up, it was actually I was on into my 20s before I knew there was anything other than farming or working in factories, right? And so I wouldn't have ever dreamed of being at the Gates Foundation now. And it's really, I really owe it to mentors, education, peers that even, you know, push me through a post-secondary education. So, uh, uh, so this is just is wonderful. And I'm curious, uh, just in terms of, of you in the room, I, I, there's, there's, there's like the education side, the workforce side. How many of you are educators here? You, you're, in other words, you wake up in the morning and you're thinking about how am I, how am I going to teach students? How many, how many are those folks? Okay. And then I assume the rest of you are workforce, economic development. That's what you think about when you get up first in the morning, right? Is that right? Okay. So uh, what I'm going to show you here is, <laughs> is uh, for those of you, uh, and, and uh, this is what I've seen over, uh, over years of, of talking about this kind of work. For those of you that are from, uh, for, we're actually within uh, the educational system, you're going to say, whoa, that is a super heavy lift guy. What are you talking about? I'm not sure we can do that. It's a big deal. Uh, and those of you that are outside of higher education will say, isn't that what you're supposed to be doing anyway, <laughs> right? So, so it's a very interesting kind of uh, dynamic, and you're both in the same room. And so uh, the $100 million lesson, so this is, by the way, just from the, the body of work that I lead now. Uh, this is not all of the investments of our post-secondary team. But, uh, but we, what we do know, and I, I'm not bringing up graphs and statistics, but what we do know for sure is that we lose a lot of students because of remedial need. Anybody in education knows that that is a, an enormous hurdle right at the beginning for students is just simply underpreparedness. Made loads of investments over the years, and there was some, uh, there's been very strong learning in this area. So what you, what you see here is what I, I just call our four pillars. So you see the best, most promising work done across these four areas. What it happens to bridge K-12 to higher ed to help students avoid remediation. Uh, when students actually show up, and for their post-secondary ed experience, are they, uh, how are they placed? I mean, how are they assessed? I mean, there's all kinds of questions around that. So we need to make sure they're placed properly in the right place to be most successful. Foundational mastery is, an, is another way of talking about developmental education, which traditionally has been a thing all off to the side and to itself, with dedicated faculty, with students that are coming from, I was a faculty member for a good number of years, and one of the things that happened uh, is actually tragically now looking back is we segregated not just our students but our faculty and moved them to uh, units so you had the real students, right, who were in programs, uh, the real math faculty, for example, were in the departments, and you had everybody else that, was, that just needed to learn and catch up. And so, uh, so there's a lot of work being done in the area of how we design curriculum for students that aren't prepared in math and English in particular, and uh, how we deliver that, how we teach it. And the final bit is student supports. And there's uh, another way to think about that is wraparound services. So uh, about $100 million invested in that. A lot of learning, a lot of things uh, did not work. A lot of things are working and, and, uh, and working well now. So the uh, four quick bullet points here on what we've learned is, uh, it's, it, I say here just, I start this by saying approach unbundling, that's a, it's a term you see floating around in higher education, uh, cautiously, and I, I can say more about this maybe later, but the, uh, especially for this group, because there's something really sexy about flexible education where you can, you know, jump in, get a credential, jump out, take, you know, jump back in over somewhere else, take a few courses, 
uh, to work for a while, jump back in, do something else. And that makes intuitive sense. That, that's what we that's stackable credentials, and that, and that is a good thing, and that's something we should all be thinking about. But oftentimes that leaves students wandering because there aren't clear paths. You know, it's, that's, you know, if you think about if, where I come from, when you don't know many people go to college, how in the world can you imagine navigating such a, such a system of off and on ramps? So the, the best work that we've seen in the field isn't sort of pick one of, these, one, of these, one of these areas or one of these columns and work in it, but rather how do you go deep across them? How do you bring a truly integrated student support, teaching and learning structure and pathway to students? And uh, second point is that it's all for the foundation now, it has been for some time, but we're very, very serious about this now. There's enough evidence, which is not as much as we want on anything, but there's enough evidence to say it's time to scale. It's time to be very serious about, about taking what works for a few students and making sure that it works for a lot of students in a lot of places. And so what we know is by, again, cafeteria approach, picking one or two things from the column here is not going to produce robust results at scale. You really have to address the full whole person, the full whole student, and the system in which they're a part in terms of their education. The basic principle of uh, co-rec remediation, and that's all kinds of definitions that are full around, but here's the, this is a value statement too. I want to be really clear about this value statement from the foundation, is that the principle under co-rec is that almost all, or all, students can succeed if they're, if they're supported, right? So I, I remember coming from, I remember the years of sitting in faculty meetings and actually hearing comments about, uh, well, that such and such students just aren't stu college material. Well, maybe a few, but when it's sometimes 70, 80, 90 percent of our students that come to our, <laughs> come to our institutions, something is wrong, right? So students can succeed if they're properly supported, and we see that working in all kinds of ways. And a uh, last learning point is it's not just about the interventions. It's, just not, it's not just about the curriculum. It's not just about something you're doing in student support services. It's about, it's about those interventions. It's about the infrastructure that you build within institutions and within your state or system. Because we in, we, I, I invest at the state or system level. So what kind of infrastructure is being built to provide support continually ongoing to the institutions and the faculty and the advisors that work with the students, and also a cultivation of capacity. We began the day with uh, uh, President Crow. It would be wonderful if every uh, educational institution had a leader like that. Now, what I can say is, is all the institutional leaders I've met are dedicated, committed, care deeply about their, their institutions and their students and their region, but there are a set of capacities that much fewer, many fewer leaders have around leadership and understanding how to deal with all the, uh, all the, you know, the, the things that come at them. And so uh, cultivation of capacities. Last thing just to show you is this is where we are now. This is what we, we've, the big sort of lesson is, uh, again, there's no silver bullets. There's a, Eric Treisman is, a, is a, a partner of the foundation. He's developed a new Mathways program, and he says there's no silver bullet, but there's silver buckshot. And I actually think that's, that's, that's a great way to talk. You know, so, there, so if we can think about how we uh, look at the whole student, and this is the bit, by the way, where those of you from outside of higher ed are going to go, in this common sense? But designing your institution and the experience around higher education that's student-centric that thinks about creating clear pathways for students as a part of their educational experience is, is in some cases, uh, not only an evolution of the educational system, but a revolution, right? So when students come, they just think about it in really easy ways. Begin with the end in mind. All of you that are here have been talking about workforce and economic development. That's the end. Begin with the end in mind. How are we structuring programs that clarify what a pathway is? And you'll see some, but there's things like meta majors, degree maps. There's also sort of supporting technologies, for example, around this work. How do you make paths clear for students? How do you help them get on a path, which is traditionally where remediation and dev ed sit? But how can it not be just a repetition of high school courses, but rather a true on-ramp to programs of study and paths to career, right? And then how do you keep them on a path? Right? 
uh, what kind of technologies, early alert systems, what kinds of things can be instituted uh, in the institutional context to help students be successful. So uh, I could say more, but I'm, I'm going to stop and uh, return to my seat. <laughs> Thanks. Stay there for just so, Paul, um, your strategy has evolved, that of Gates, over the years. You've had your share of successes, and winners and losers, successes and failures. So, uh, you have mentioned two things. Um, you have mentioned properly supported. That's a phrase you've used multiple times. And second, and finally, at the last, student-centered educational opportunities. What then... Um, in terms of these two and the other lessons learned, um, can we expect to hear from you about achieving systemic impact of all the work that has come through the Gates Foundation? Okay, so the, uh, the uh, broadly speaking, the investments that I'm making now are, are based on, so just a really quick uh, note. So I, I come from, uh, I was a faculty member uh, but I, I was also trained as a community organizer years back. So I, I, at my, I went through this uh, point in my life where I was uh, struggling about, am I going to be an organizer out in communities or I'm going to be in higher education? And a mentor said to me, totally wrong question. You need to be an organizer wherever you are, mm -hmm. right? And I thought, well, that's, that's, uh, that's some important <laughs> some important advice. So one of the conditions I had to come into the foundation was I, I need to spend time in the field. I actually spent six months in the field uh, doing field research, listening uh, to people all across the board, right? So this, these were advisors of student, uh, advisors with students, uh, system leaders, uh, faculty members, institutional presidents, and uh, these were in focus states all across the country. And, uh, and, and uh, the key things, two major things, uh, came up, one of which was no surprise at all for me, which is that faculty really care. I mean, I mean there's uh, faculty can be uh, uh, set up sometimes as obstinate and, uh, and, and uh, sort of obstacles to some of the work that we're talking about that's actually quite innovative. Uh, we've been talking about here for the last two days. But faculty care, they're teachers, they care about their students, but so much seems to be done to them they can actually be leaders in the work. And so uh, a significant part of my investments are going to build an infrastructure that, help, that can help support faculty in particular around being key players into the kinds of redesigns that we need to see. And um, uh, on, on the one hand, in the, the, uh, and that's usually state and system level infrastructure. And on the other, there's uh, many, many, many interventions out there. But what we know is that uh, things that you pull off the shelf uh, don't necessarily work uh, very well because places are different, people are different, populations are different. So we're investing in not just technologies, but also approaches that have this uh, high degree of adaptability where they're based on core principles and we know where we have the most evidence. For example, if, if you know of, a, so in New York, there's this program called ASAP, CUNY ASAP. It's a, it's something that actually is not embedded in academic affairs, but is embedded in student support services. And it has uh, remarkable outcomes in terms of seeing students not just through a dev ed sequence, but through graduation, through completion of a program. And so it's focusing on infrastructure that supports the people who have the most direct access to students and the, the what, the bits that come down the line that can be applied and, and used. And uh, last thing I'll say, is uh, I know you're breaking out into state, state teams next, and uh, that's a fantastic part of this meeting because you're going to, I assume, leave with a sort of a work product. Huge piece of advice in, in, in our own learning and my own personal experience. Make sure you're investing at, what, what, in my language, you're investing at the joints, right? At the places where typically there is nobody. You'll have maybe a strong work fo workforce representative, a strong institutional represented from a community college, for example, but you just sort of rely on, a, on just an informal relationship or a loose meeting structure to figure out how you actually work together, find a way to invest very intentionally in the joint between the intersections between all the, the pieces, because that kind of organizing will take you far. So thanks so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. 
that is an answer to a question I have not yet asked, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, in the meantime, uh, USA Funds is one of America's great success stories. Uh, I was at the conference in uh, DC when the group was brought together from across the country to look at the problem. USA Funds is focused on the 40-50 problem, meaning that 40% of all students who enter college fail to complete their degree, and half of those who do, who actually graduate, end up underemployed, unemployed, or floating between. So what is the funds, Lorenzo, uh, to dealing with this problem? What is the fund's intent uh, in terms of dealing with the problem? Thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, let me say that USA Funds is very pleased to be a part of this conversation. And I'd like to personally commend Bill for uh, bringing about this very important uh, conversation. Um, first, a little bit about USA Funds before I respond to your question. First of all, USA Funds has been around since about 1960, and we've been in the business of promoting preparation for, access to, and completion in higher education for the last 55 years. Most of that work has been centered around uh, access to college, providing about $250 billion in support for college costs for students and their families. Uh, for about, about 22 million students uh, in the last 55 years. So with the arrival of our CEO, Bill Hansen, in July of 2013, we really uh, developed a new focus that we call completion with the purpose uh, that you have described earlier. So I'm going to talk a little bit from our, what I call our playbook. No deflated footballs here. It's all above ground. Uh, so that you understand specifically what it is we do and how we deploy our strategy at USA Funds. So what, what do we mean by completion with a purpose? So basically, we're seeking to uh, promote uh, more purposeful pathways to and through college or other post-secondary education or training uh, through what we call rewarding careers and fulfilling lives. So the completion with a purpose uh, focus is centered around the 40-50 challenge. 40% 40 of students who start in four-year degree uh, uh, seeking programs who do not complete six years later. And the other 50% who do complete and are under, underemployed, unemployed, or if they could do it all over again, they'd choose a different major. So how do we, or who do we seek to serve through this completion with a purpose strategy? Uh, on the left side of the screen, you'll see the answer to that. So our interest is with at-risk youth particularly those students who are overcoming economic obstacles to education pathways and uh, successful careers. And obviously we're interested in the disconnected youth that's been such a prominent part of the conversation over the last day and a half. The 16 to 24 year olds who are either um, not in school and who are unemployed. Then we also have an interest in non-completers, working with the working adults who are age 24 to 64 who have some degree, or some college rather, but who have not completed that, that degree. The more than 36 million Americans who are in that category. And then finally, the underemployed. Those college graduates uh, who are either unemployed or working in jobs for which their education really hasn't uh, measured up, or they're, they're, and they're in need of additional skills, training, et cetera. So how are we addressing the challenges uh, for these populations? We're providing grant funding uh, and leveraging partnerships. And I'd like to, and this is very important or unique as I, I'd like to say to our strategy. We are targeting those partnerships at the, the local, state, and national levels. And working with post-secondary institutions and associations. So through all of those partnerships, we're seeking to, to do what? To inform policy change at the local level, at the state level, at the national level, supporting direct services. A lot of our grantees were here, so this meeting was very confirming to me that we are, our strategy is spot on. And certainly, we're seeking to support initiatives that are designed to spur, spur innovation, particularly we're funding the University Innovation Alliance, which uh, the Gates Foundation is also a supporter and about four other 
foundations, and Arizona State University is a prominent uh, part of that uh, collaboration. So what are we learning from completion with the purpose? We're learning that because no single organization, no one here on this panel and no one in this room or all of us can resolve these challenges alone. I think uh, what we're learning that works most is it is important to engage governors. It's important to engage higher education leaders, mayors and other community leaders and partners, com uh, community-based organizations, et cetera, in these partnerships and particularly the education community, K-12, two-year, four-year, and other post-secondary education training um, sources. So finally, I'd say that the conference is, is uh, very confirming to me, and uh, I'd like to recognize any USA Funds grantees in the room. Raise your hand or stand. Give them a round of applause. So certainly we supported uh, jo Jobs for America's graduates, and the CEO was here speaking on yesterday. We just expanded that work in Montana where we're seeking to serve more students in Montana uh, with that particular program. Uh, as I said, we're funding Arizona State with the University Innovation Alliance. Um, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, who was here yesterday, we're funding, that's a national effort. Uh, Jason, that you heard from at least twice on yesterday, and Cheryl Od Odom, very pleased with that work. So thank you for the work. The final way that I say that we're promoting completion with a purpose is through research. Uh, development and dissemination of policy. So we ask of all of our grantees, not only are you achieving, are you achieving the goals and objectives that you told us you, you would seek to achieve when you, we funded you, we want to know how are you amplify, amplifying that learning. So what is the learning at the local level, the state level, and for others through convenings, through publications, et cetera? Thank you. Thank you so very much, Lorenzo. We're grateful to you. And I must uh, take this opportunity to indicate that I am the treasurer of Jobs for America's graduates. And I'm very grateful to USA for the funds you have provided. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And also I might mention that the state of Montana that uh, Lorenzo mentioned USA funds uh, being applied to a, this program called JAG is focusing on the Native American tribes. Uh, in the state, and the governor has made a commitment to that. So hopefully your funds will uh, have made such a significant difference in one state, and we will have some kind of an understanding of what can be done that will make a, diff a significant difference. And now, our next uh, speaker is um, a marvelous individual whose name is Jack Grayson. Jack is with the American Productivity and Quality Center uh, APQC's members include hundreds of the country's largest corporations, and you've worked for years uh, to help businesses improve productivity, quality, and management. But now, you're addressing the need for systemic reform in education. Uh, tell us then, if you will, what you're advocating and how it relates to what we've been discussing at this conference thus far. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. How many of you know APQC and what it is? Would you hold up your hand? I see four or five people who know about it. How many of you know that I ran price controls under Nixon? Thank you. I'm glad there are not many of you. The two are related. And Bill knows, because when he was with Business Week, I wrote an article saying this country is not paying enough attention to productivity or quality. And so on that basis, the editor went out, and then the editor of Business Week called me and said, how many responses did you get? I said, zero. He said,